We'll start with a prayer for the glorification of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O most holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise and thank you for the gift of holiness you granted to your faithful servant, Luisa Picaretta. She lived, dear Father, in your divine will and became under the influence of the Holy Spirit, similar to your son who died on the cross due to his obedience. She was a victim and a host welcome to you, thus contributing to the redemption of mankind. Her virtues of obedience, humility, love of Christ and to the church urged to ask you for the gift of her glorification on earth so that your glory may shine and your kingdom of truth, justice and love may spread all over the world in the particular charism of the fiat voluntas tua Sicut in cielo et in terra. We appeal to you by her merits to obtain from you, O Most Holy Trinity, the particular grace of her beatification, which we ask of you with and in your divine will. Amen. O Most Sacred Heart of my Jesus, who chose your humble servant Louisa as the herald of the kingdom of your divine will and the angel of reparation for the countless sins that grieve your divine heart, we humbly pray you to grant us the grace through her intercession that we implore of your mercy so that she may be glorified on earth as you have rewarded her in heaven. Amen. Now this prayer for her beatification uh, was uh, written by Archbishop Picari of Happy, Happy Memory before uh, he became the uh, ordinary for uh, the region of, that included Corrado. Uh, he was not all that familiar with Luisa, but thanks be to God, he had the integrity and desire to serve the people well and to learn about Luisa as quickly and as uh, profoundly as he could. And so he authored this prayer and it's uh, beautiful because in this prayer, he makes it clear that we can appeal to Luisa to intercede for us. And so we certainly do well to ask her to intercede for us as we study the writings and especially in our meetings. And so we ask Louisa to intercede because she suffered tremendously to uh, be obedient to the requirement to write down everything that Jesus was telling her and showing her and giving her by way of experiences. I wanna move on to um, uh, ex excerpts from yesterday's first reading at Mass. It was take, this is taken from uh, Colossians 1.9. We hear St. Paul saying, We do not cease praying and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Now, they didn't know back then, so St. Paul didn't know back then what we know now about what the Lord says about how vitally important it is to gain knowledge of God's will. God's will is the divine will, the one will held in common by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so even back then, the Lord was inspiring this pointing to the reign of the divine will. So the prayer then, and we hope that uh, St. Paul is praying for us now, that we may be filled with the knowledge of God's will, and it goes on to walk. And so for us, to, we should understand to live in a manner worthy of the Lord. And for a human being, the, the highest level of worthiness of the Lord is the divine will divinizing our acts, the divine will reigning in what we say and do. So uh, <clears throat> this walking or living the will of God and the will of God reigning in our walking and living, all that we say and do. It goes on so as to be fully pleasing in every good work. We can understand uh, works as acts. And so the only way we can be fully pleasing is if the divine life is animating what we do is operating freely because we are decreasing, our independence is decreasing so that his reign in us can increase. And so fully pleasing in every good work or act, bearing fruit and growing in that, here we are again, the knowledge of God. The more that we know of the, the will of God, the more that we can come to know God more intimately, more personally, strengthened with 
every power, so not just the human strength, the human power that is given to, to uh, individuals, but every power is the fullness of power. And the fullness of power is only uh, flowing from the will of God in accord with his glorious might. All of this is related to the infinitude, the limitlessness of God's own life and will for us. He delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So in salvation, so when someone embraces the fact that Jesus is the Lord and they strive to live the gospel, they want to resist uh, temptation to sin, they're trying to stay in the state of grace, that is a beginning. But the kingdom of his beloved son is the fullness of his own life uh, living in and operating through us. And may it uh, please the Lord that we strive for this to be a reality in us all the time. I believe, uh, Melanie, that um, we're on page 67, starting with August 5th. Is that what you have? Yes, that's what I have. Okay. Uh, thank you for being with us. And um, please go ahead. Okay. August 5th, 1904. Jesus, ruler of kings and lord of lords. Continuing in my usual state, blessed Jesus came for just a little. In the act of ruling and dominating everything and of reigning with the crown of king on his head and with the scepter of command in his hand. While I was seeing him in this position, he told me, though in Latin, but I will say it according to what I understood. My daughter, I am the ruler of kings and the Lord of lords. To me alone is this right of justice due, which the creature owes me. And by not giving it to me, she denies me as creator and master of everything. While saying this, he seemed to take the world in his hand and turn it upside down so that creatures would submit to his regime and dominion. At the same time, I could also see how the Lord ruled and dominated my soul with such mastery that I felt all submerged in him. From him came the regime of my mind, of my affections, of my desires. Many electric wires passed between me and him through which he directed and dominated everything. So these electric wires, we want to be careful when we're reading a, a mystic's account that we don't move into a fundamentalism. So it's not that there were these actual wires running from the Lord to her, but she's trying to use a terminology that would give us a little bit of a, a glimpse of her understanding. We know that the Lord is the light and the life of each and every one of us. So the very light that flows like electric wires uh, is how she recognized this, uh, this uh, life that he's granting. From him came the regime of my mind. So of every thought, of every understanding, of all affection, of my desires. Many electric wires passed between me and through which he directed and dominated everything. But he's not a, um, uh, he doesn't dominate as in a forceful way. He's dominating because she's surrendering uh, to the reign of his will, to the lordship of his will, the fact that he is the king of all rulers, which he points out earlier in this passage. To me alone is the right of justice due. And re I think it was at the last meeting, I've certainly done it on more than one occasion, talking about when we ask for justice, the first order of justice is to give God what he deserves from us because everything that we have comes from him. And so uh, he says um, uh, the right of justice due to him, which the creature owes because of our existence and all the gifts that he grants us. And by not giving it to me, she denies me as creator and master of everything. And so we want to be careful that we don't deliberately deny the Lord reigning in our acts and our thoughts in all that we say and do, because he is the creator and master, the sustainer of our lives. And then he, uh, this example of his turning the world upside down. Actually, that's happening right now uh, with um, 
uh, storms, hurricanes, uh, volcanoes, earthquakes. <clears throat> He's turning the world upside down so that creatures would submit to his regime and dominion. He's not doing it uh, out of an anger to, to punish. He's doing it out of a genuine concern that we turn to him so that we can have what he created us to enjoy for all eternity. So <clears throat> I've had people, especially uh, related to the Old Testament, come to me and say, you know, it's hard for me to, to think about an angry, um, vindictive God. And I'll tell them, well, it's good that it's hard for you to think of him that way because <clears throat> they did sometimes see him as such in their descriptions in the Old Testament, but they didn't have the, the, uh, the image of the living God in Christ that's in the readings at Mass today, okay? He's the, the, the fullest revelation of the love of God that is possible for us to have in his humanity, in the humanity of Jesus Christ. And so the self-sacrifice that God uh, took on himself for our sake to make it clear that he's never vindictive and he's not angry with us. He, get, he could be angry with uh, the enemy that uh, can tempt us and rob us of some of the goods that the Lord created us to enjoy. And so this turning of the world, the chastisements that the, we heard in the readings last week, and we're going to continue to hear about them, is because he wants us with him forever. He doesn't want any of the goods he created us to enjoy or any of the souls he has created uh, to be lost. And so he, he goes through one thing after another as a loving father trying to find ways to get through to us. And uh, tomorrow at our day of prayer in our one of our two sessions, I'm going to talk about obstinacy and soft ob obstinacy. And uh, both get in the way of his bringing about for us the goods for which he created us. Okay, go ahead. August 6, 1904. The privation is pain of fire that ignites, consumes, annihilates, and its purpose is to destroy the human life to constitute the divine. This morning, I went through a most bitter time because of the privation of my highest and only good. The sorrow of the privation was that as I found myself outside of myself, the pain of my soul was so great that the pain itself administered such strength to it that it wanted to destroy whatever it found as hindrance to finding its all, God. And not finding him, it would shout, cry, run, more than wind. It wanted to upset everything, to turn everything upside down in order to find the life it was lacking. Oh, privation, how intense is your bitterness. Your sorrow is always new, and because it is new, the soul feels the bitterness of the pain as ever new. My soul feels as if one whole flesh would separate into many shreds and all those shreds with justice ask for their life and will find it only if they find God who is more than their life. But who can say the state I was in? Meanwhile, saints, angels and purging souls rushed up to me, placing themselves in circle around me and preventing me from running compassionating me and assisting me. But everything was useless for me because in them I could not find the one who alone could soothe my pain and restore my life. And so I shouted more, crying out, tell me where, where can I find him? If you want to have pity on me, do not delay him to me for I can take no more. Then after this, he came out from within the depth of my soul, and it seemed that he pretended to be sleeping without being concerned about the hardness of my poor state. But even though he would not bother and was sleeping, at merely seeing him, I breathed my life as one breathes air, saying, ah, he is here with me. However, I was not freed of the pain in seeing that he would not even pay attention to me. Then, after much suffering, as if he had awakened, he told me, My daughter, all other tribulations can be penances, expiations, compensations, but only the privation is pain of fire that ignites, 
consumes, annihilates, and does not give up until it sees the human life destroyed. But while it consumes, it vivifies and it constitutes delight, divine life in it. Until it sees the human life destroyed. When we hear this kind of expression, we have to understand he created us as human beings and he doesn't want human beings to be destroyed. He wants the independent trying to act like God's in and of our own rights destroyed. So what he wants is children, uh, true sons and daughters of the divine will is his, uh, his greatest desire for us. We have from an early church father, uh, the glory of God is man fully alive. Well, man fully alive is pointed to in that uh, reading that I started with from Colossians, when the life of God is reigning. And we heard in the previous uh, reading about the dominion that is so necessary in each and every one of us. And so the dominion of God in us uh, brings us, thanks be to God, because of his incomprehensible generosity, brings us to a whole new level, a whole new um, existence in him. But we don't lose our identity, but it's a new identity because of the relationship with him. And so we see about uh, a third of the way down uh, on this passage she, your sorrow is always new because it is new. The soul feels the bitterness of the pain as ever new. Now, <clears throat> when you were hearing about her uh, grieving, the fact that she couldn't sense him, so she was being deprived of the sense of his presence or the, the beauty of his voice or being able to gaze upon him, uh, it's, it's easy with Louisa, especially for people the first time through the volumes, to uh, kind of shift into a, oh boy, here we go again. She's complaining. No, she's not complaining. She's suffering. And in her expression of her suffering, she's, um, she's offering love to God. She's unbosoming this anguish over not being able to have the fullness of her experiences of his presence and his voice and his embraces, the light that flows from his mind into hers. And, and so for her, it's new because it's happening right now. So you could say, uh, you know, if you, um, we saw Hanan earlier with, with the neck brace. Well, <clears throat> the pain that she's experiencing right now, even though she had pain, let's say yesterday or the day before, the pain that she's experiencing right now is like it's new because it's now. And that's what was going on with Louisa. It was moment by moment, the suffering that was extreme. And Jesus makes it clear that the, the being deprived of all that she has enjoyed in the past is the worst kind of suffering for her. And yes, she knows that he's in her interior because he's moved in her interior many times in the past when she's appealing to him to please, where are you? Well, she knows that he's in, in her interior, but it feels as if he's not there because she's been deprived of any sense of his presence. Think about the times that you may have sat in front of the Blessed Sacrament and I believe that everybody's with our group. Um, right now, I think we have close to 40 people. I haven't looked again. I, I don't, uh, once we get started with the reflections, I, I don't check. And then it looks like there's about 30 or 40 people that look at the recordings on the web. Thanks be to God. But uh, uh, the, I believe that everybody that's studying Luisa's writings are at some stage of um, believing that uh, he he is in our interior from spiritually, at least from our baptism and physically in Holy Communion. So think about the times that you're sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament with faith in his real presence, consciously present in the tabernacle, uh, but devoid of any sensation. All of us have had those experiences. All of us have probably had the experience of a warmth and uh, feeling very comforted and having time in Eucharistic adoration, but other times when it feels like it's one distraction after another. I don't feel like my prayers are even all that sincere. I keep trying to focus and I can't get focused that well. And uh, <clears throat> well, that's just a tiny, tiny taste of what she was suffering in her being deprived. You know, in the, in the uh, writings of, of the church, the mystics that had been privileged with uh, experiences, they call it the desert experience, mm -hmm. a very dry time spiritually. Well, she's going, she's going through that. 
And then he says, and this is important, this uh, gives us a little bit of an idea of what purgatory is like. My daughter, all the other tribulations can be penances. The other hardships on earth can be penances, expiations, compensations, but only the privation. So think about this. The soul on the day that that person crosses the threshold, which we call death, and enters eternal life, okay, sees him face to face in that first judgment. And they review every single thought, every single action of the entire life. And the Lord has plenty of time, so it's no problem for him to make that review with us. And <clears throat> having seen the magnificence of God and feeling the love of God, even not, and especially the pain of knowing that we're not ready if we have voids of love in our soul, then he says, only the privation is pain of fire that ignites, consumes, annihilates, and does not give up until it sees the, those voids or the independence, the lack of perfect love at every moment destroyed. But while it consumes, it vivifies and constitutes divine life in it. So that's a process that we use uh, in different descriptions related to purgatory, like flames, okay, because we don't have words for the kind of annihilation that a soul will go through for every area in the course of one's entire life that had nothing to do with God, and even more so, even the forgiven sins that were against God. And uh, so on this side of death, when we invite the divine will into all that we say and do, and ask that it be multiplied to the infinite, by God's own desire to multiply it to the infinite, to repair for all the voids of love in my life, but not just in my life, as important as that is, but in the lives of all souls, so that we can bring, bring reparation to the most holy trinity for the lack of love of so many souls. And uh, uh, if we do it with sincerity and uh, totality at the level that's possible for us, uh, it will constitute a divine life in us in such a way that it will dramatically shorten or, for some souls, eliminate the need for any time in purgatory because of the consuming love within the soul to, to love God with God's own love. Okay, go ahead. August 7th, 1904. The first to persecute the church will be the religious. As I was in my usual state, I found myself surrounded by angels and saints who said to me, it is necessary that you suffer more for the imminent things that are about to happen against the church. For if they do not come about imminently, time will make them happen in a milder way and with lesser offense to God. And I said, is suffering perhaps in my power? If the Lord gives it to me, I will gladly suffer. Meanwhile, they took me and brought me before the throne of our Lord, and they prayed together that he would make me suffer. And blessed Jesus, coming toward us in the form of the crucified, shared his pains with me. Not only once, but I spent almost all morning amid continuous renewals of the crucifixion. Afterwards, he said to me, My daughter, Sufferings divert my just indignation, and the light of grace is renewed in the human minds. Ah, daughter, do you think that it will be the secular who will be the first to persecute my church? Ah, no. It will be the religious, the very leaders who, pretending now to be my sons, shepherds, while in reality they are poisonous snakes that poison themselves and others, will begin among themselves to lacerate this good mother, and then the secular will follow. Then as obedience called me, the Lord withdrew, but all embittered. Okay, Melanie, in your book, uh, you might mark this page or uh, do something uh, so that you don't lose your place uh, so we can come back to it. But I'd like you to turn to page 53. Uh, I'm going to say something to give you just a little time to go to page 53, and I'm going to have you read that passage again, because the notation that I made, and you might make it in your own book, those who are uh, following along in the selection of the, uh, of the volumes, 
uh, uh, for this one that uh, Melanie just read, August 7, 1904, on page 69, I made a notation to go back to page 53 and read the entry of, um, uh, let's see, April 29, 1904. So here the Lord is talking to her again about uh, our mother, the church, and the, the sick condition of the church back in 1904. Yeah. And it uh, should be clear to us that what was happening then and what he was talking about is definitely at a much uh, uh, increased level happening now. But we have to be very careful. <clears throat> While he says very strong words related to the damage and the, the spiritual depravity, sickness of people within the church, we are not to stand in judgment. We are not to think we're better than them. But with this light related to the condition of the church and the sinfulness of those who are leaders or teachers in the church, we are to take on, and she's asking, should I, do I have the power to offer myself in more suffering, okay? And we are to embrace the sufferings that have been given to us, united with the sufferings of Christ, because he's the one that allows those sufferings. And I'm not talking about not getting medicine. Uh, Hanan, after the car accident, she should have gone to the hospital and gotten the care. When I crashed my motorcycle, I wore one of those collars myself. We get the care that uh, is necessary, but in the pain that we're experiencing, the suffering that we're experiencing, if we unite it to the sufferings of Christ, and especially if we invite the divine will into our accepting, thanking, and offering what we're experiencing, it becomes salvific. It's taken to a level that we couldn't possibly give it ourselves. We give it to the Lord, and he turns it into something that is a remedy for the very issues that are being addressed in this passage. So, Melanie, if you're ready, I'm going to have you just read all the way through it, uh, okay. April 29, 1904, on page 53. Oh, okay. April 29, 1904. The divine life manifests itself in creatures through words, through works, and through sufferings. But what manifests it more clearly are the sufferings. Continuing in my usual state, I found myself surrounded by three virgins who took me and wanted to crucify me on a cross by sheer force. But since I did not see blessed Jesus, fearing, I resisted them. On seeing my resistance, they told me, dearest sister, do not fear that our spouse is not here. Allow us to begin to crucify you for the Lord. Drawn by the virtue of sufferings will come. We are coming from heaven. And since we have seen most grave evils about to happen in Europe, we have come to make you suffer so that at least they might be milder. In the meantime, they pierced my hands and my feet through with the nails, but with such cruelty of pain that I felt it was dying. Now, while I was suffering, blessed Jesus came, and looking at me, at me with severe eyes, he told me, who commanded you to put yourself in these sufferings? Of what use are you to me then? Then to make me unable even to be free to do what I want, and to be a continuous hindrance to my justice. In my interior, I said, what does he want from me? Neither did I want this. They have been the ones who induced me and he gets upset with me. But I could not speak because of the bitterness of the pain. On seeing the severity of our Lord, those virgins made me suffer more, pulling the nails out and then driving them in again. And they brought me closer to him, showing him my sufferings. The more I suffered, the more it seemed that the Lord was appeased. And when they saw him more appeased and almost moved by my suffering, they left me and went away, leaving me alone with our Lord. Then he himself assisted me and sustained me. And in seeing me suffer, to cheer me, he told me, my daughter, my life manifests itself in the creatures through words, through works, and through sufferings. But what manifests it more clearly are the sufferings. Okay, so on the margin, you might write mystery of justice and suffering. Uh, and the reason I uh, suggest that 
is that what we have here is an explanation of his divine will, because no human being can do this on their own, but his divine will operating in Louisa as she was uh, accepting the suffering that she was being put through. It was um, mitigating the impact of justice that was due on humanity because of their sinfulness. And his severity is because of the condition of the world. While she feels it as he's addressing her because it's, it's in essence blocking his bringing justice upon those people, he, she is fulfilling the very mission that he has given her. And so uh, note that then he is the one that uh, attends to her. And, and uh, at the end of this uh, paragraph makes it clear that the most effective way to hold back justice and to appease him for what he rightly deserves from all humanity and is not getting is her suffering being offered to him and it's in a divine manner. So it's, it's at the level of his suffering. He's the one that makes it possible for her suffering to have that, that uh, limitless power because the divine will is reigning in her. Okay, go ahead. In the meantime, the confessor came to call me to obedience, but partly because of the sufferings, partly because the Lord would not leave me, I was unable to obey. So I lamented to my Jesus, telling him, Lord, how come the confessor is here at this hour? Why did he have to come right now? And he, my daughter, let him be with us for a while and also participate in my graces. When one frequents a house continuously, he participates in its crying and in its laughter, in its poverty and in its riches. The same for the confessor. Has he not participated in your mortifications and privations? How he participates in my presence. And it seemed that he communicated divine fortitude to him, telling him, the life of God in the soul is hope. And the more you hope, the more divine life you contain within yourself. And since divine life contains power, wisdom, fortitude, love, the soul feels herself as though being watered by as many streams for as many as are the divine virtues. And so the divine life keeps growing within you. But if you do not have, excuse me, but if you do not hope both in spiritual things and through the spiritual, the corporal too will participate. The divine life will be gradually consumed until it is completely extinguished. Therefore hope, hope always. So I don't know if I mentioned this when we were at this passage before, you might write hope slash certitude in the margin because when Jesus is talking about hope in this manner, it's like the hope that Benedict, Pope Emeritus, uh, in Space Salve articulated. It's not a wish. It is a looking forward with certitude. It's a total trust that everything that God offers is available to those who are responding to his offer, those who are giving themselves to him. All the goods that he has prepared for us are already ours, even though we don't have the full use of them yet. That's the kind of um, understanding that the use of the word hope should have here. Okay, go ahead. Then I was just barely able to receive communion. And afterwards, I found myself outside of myself. And I saw three men in the shape of three untamed horses raging throughout Europe, making a great bloody slaughter. It seemed that they wanted to ensnare most of Europe in fierce wars, as though it sighed a net. All were trembling at the sight of those incarnate devils, and many were destroyed by them. Incarnate devils, the spirit of the Antichrist. We know uh, in sacred scripture there will be a time at the end of the world when there will be the Antichrist, but the spirit of the Antichrist is operative in a lot of persons throughout history, certainly in our day. Uh, so we go to page 68 now. Thank you for uh, going back to that earlier uh, reading, Melanie, and, and we can take up where we left off. Okay. Uh, let's see. August 7th, 1904. 
Yes, uh, I'm sorry, page 69. Okay, I'm sorry, we're at August 8th, right? Uh, yes. Okay, sorry, August 8th, 1904. The soul must look for Jesus within herself, not outside. Everything must be enclosed in one word, love. One who loves Jesus is another Jesus. While I continued struggling, my adorable Jesus came for just a little, but even though I felt him near me, I would try to grab him and he would escape me, almost preventing me from going outside of myself to go in search of him. Then after I struggled very much, he made himself seen for just a little and told me, my daughter, do not look for me outside of yourself, but within yourself, in the depths of your soul. Because if you go outside and do not find me, you will suffer very much and will not be able to endure. If you can find me more easily, why do you want to struggle more? And I, it is because I believe that not finding you immediately within myself, I can find you outside. It is love that pushes me to this. And he, ah, it is love that pushes you to do this. Everything, everything should be enclosed in one single word, love. If the soul does not enclose everything in this, it can be said that she does not know a thing about loving me. And according to how much the soul loves me, so do I expand the gift of suffering. And I, interrupting him, all surprised and afflicted, said, my life and my whole good. So since I suffer little or nothing, I love you little or not at all. What fright, the mere thought that I do not love you? My soul feels a sharp disappointment and I even almost feel offended by you. And he added, I do not intend to disappoint you. Your disappointment would press on my heart more than on your own. And besides, you must not look at the mere corporal sufferings, but also at the spiritual and at the true will you have to suffer. Because if the soul truly wants to suffer, for me, it is as if the soul had suffered. Therefore, calm yourself and do not be troubled. And let me continue speaking. At the bottom of this paragraph, uh, I wrote the beauty of right intention. And the reason is that he points out to her that if she wants to suffer for love of him, for all that it can accomplish in reparation and utility for the salvation of souls, if she wants that and she's ready to give her fiat, her let it be done, and she's not experiencing physically or spiritually a suffering at the moment, okay. the very desire, the readiness, the yes that's in place, he gives the full credit of having suffered. So whenever we want to do the will of God, to live the will of God, and we don't see it unfolding, the merit is, and it's far more than just gaining merit, but the merit is already in place because he reads the heart. He sees the intention. He knows the desire. When we're doing everything we can to scramble to get away from whatever it is that we don't want or to pursue something that we want, because of our own desires that are not connected to wanting what he wants, he sees those intentions as well. And then this, um, he says, uh, this is probably a little scary for um, maybe all of us. When he says, uh, loving him, according to how much the soul loves, so he will expand the gift of suffering. And I was just reading uh, <clears throat> the mystic from the 1800s, uh, in uh, I, for, I, I don't want to use the name right now because we need to stay with uh, Louisa and um, uh, someone gave me the book, which I think is very interesting. This nun, uh, uh, she was uh, moving along quite well, having a lot of uh, mystical encounters. And uh, she says in her diary, and the Lord bless me with a mother superior that is so good to me, so uh, right for me, is the perfect kind of soul that I need and then she says because at every moment she humiliates me and degrades me and points out my faults now 
nowadays with pleasure and comfort and uh, freedom of any kind of um, uh, uh, suffering of any kind, uh, we could look at that and say, what? How in the world could you see that as a blessing? But we just had in a previous uh, entry, the Lord making it clear, and now we have it in this one as well, that these sufferings are like kisses that he gives us so that we can, our actions, what we're uh, offering can be incorporated in a divine manner for uh, benefits beyond anything, uh, just the individual prayers of um, good human beings, good and prayerful human beings could bring about. Okay, go ahead. Haven't you ever seen two intimate friends? Oh, how they try to imitate each other and to reproduce the other within themselves. They imitate the voice, the manners, the steps, the works, the clothes, in such a way that the friend can say, the one who loves me is another me. And since he is me, I cannot help loving him. So I do with the soul who encloses all of me within herself, as though within a small circle of love. I feel as though reproduced within her and finding myself, I love her with all my heart and I cannot do without being with her because if I leave her, I would leave myself. While saying this, he disappeared. Uh, I would say, first of all, if you go up to the previous page in the, uh, in the uh, focus for the reading, so in the bold print, it says, one who loves Jesus is another Jesus. You might correct the typo there. The uh, second word Jesus should be lowercase. So one who loves Jesus, uppercase is another Jesus lowercase. Just like um, uh, the early church father who said, God became man so that man could become God. That was not with any uh, uh, thought that we could become equal to God. Uh, it's so that we can live the life of God. We can be true sons and daughters of God, not just adopted sons and daughters of God, but having God's own life uh, as our life, coursing through our veins and animating all of our actions. And so uh, what he wants is little, little Jesuses because of his own love operating in and through us. Just like when uh, Benedict Pope Emeritus wrote Deus Caritas Est. In it, he said that the Lord wants to take us to a capacity of loving with his own love so that our loving is no longer merely human love. It is divine love. So it's Christ himself operating through us in our loving. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Okay, go ahead. August 9th, 1904. It is not the works that constitutes the merit of man, but obedience alone as a birth from the divine will. After delaying, he came for just a little, like a bolt of light, and I was left filled with this light inside and out. I am unable to say what my soul comprehended and experienced within this light. I will only say that afterwards, blessed Jesus told me, my daughter, it is not the works that constitute the merit of man, but it is obedience alone that constitutes all merits as a birth from the divine will. So much so that everything I did and suffered in the course of my life, everything was a birth from the will of the Father. This is why my merits are innumerable because they are constituted by divine obedience. Therefore, I do not look so much at the multiplicity and greatness of the works, but at the connection they have either directly with divine obedience or indirectly with obedience to one who represents me. So that indirect obedience to one who represents it would be to the superiors we have in our lives. Uh, we know that now, uh, especially in our nation, there's a lot of leaders that are calling us to obediences that we cannot obey because uh, St. John Paul uh, made it clear that we not only cannot but must not obey unjust laws okay so uh like the doctors uh, uh that uh, are having their conscience rights 
uh, oppressed uh, with a demand to perform abortions and uh, transgender surgeries and the ones with integrity, even if they're going to lose their job or refusing to do that. Uh, back east, there were 150 nurses that quit because they refused to take the vaccination. Uh, if that happened everywhere, the government would start pulling back on it's trying to force people to do things that in our hearts we know that we cannot or should not do. And so <clears throat> this obedience, though, is different in the Lord than in us. So we have to follow his example and learn how to obey as he did. There was no separation in his desire and the desire of the Father. So it was the desire of the Father in that divine will, which is the one will held in common uh, among the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, so his obedience was an immediate yes. There was no hesitation. There was no second guessing. There was a oneness, a perfection in the obedience, and that was done in his humanity for our sake. So that we can bring the immediate yes related to everything that we know pleases God and an immediate no to anything that is contrary to the will of God. Then we don't have to spend a lot of time wrestling with or rationalizing issues uh, if we always strive to only and always live the will of God. And the more that we do that deliberately and consistently, the easier it becomes, not that it ever is uh, completely easy for us on this side because in our humanity, growth and self-offering is always necessary. I want to point out that in the previous passage and then again in this passage, Jesus repeats twice and sometimes three times the word everything. Now, when Jesus says the word everything, we should be able to take that to heart and understand that it means everything. But when he says everything, everything, it's because he knows that we need to have it emphasized repeatedly in order for us to grasp the fact that he means everything. Go ahead. August 10th, 1904. God knows the number, the value, and the weight of all created things. As I was in my usual state, I found myself wandering around churches, making a pilgrimage to Jesus in the sacrament together with my guardian angel. In one of the churches, I said, prisoner of love, you are here abandoned and alone, and I have come to keep you company. And while keeping you company, I intend to love you for those who offend you, praise you for those who despise you, thank you for those in whom you pour graces, but do not render you the tribute of thanksgiving, console you for those who afflict you and repair for any offense against you. In a word, I intend to do for you all that creatures are obliged to do for you, for having remained in the most holy sacrament. And I intend to repeat this for as many drops of water, for as many fish and grains of sand as are in the sea. While I was saying this, all the waters of the sea became present before my mind. And I said within myself, my sight cannot grasp the whole vastness of the sea, nor does it know the depth and the weight of those immense waters. But the Lord knows their number, weight, and measure. And I stayed there all marveling. At that moment, blessed Jesus told me, silly, silly that you are. Why do you marvel so much? What is difficult and impossible for the creature is easy and possible and also natural for the creator. It happens in this as to someone who looking at millions and millions of coins in the twinkling of, of an eye says to himself, they are innumerable, who can count them? But the one who put them in that place tells everything in one word. They are this many, they are worth this much, they weigh this much. My daughter, I know how many drops of water I myself put in the sea and no one can disperse even a single one of them. I numbered everything. I weighed everything. I evaluated everything. And so with all the other things. So what is the wonder if I know everything? On hearing this, every marvel ceased or rather I marveled at my silliness. 
So instead of unbelievable, so that was that marveling that uh, she, the use of the word marveling, it, it's like, how can it be possible? And she accepted as a matter of fact. And so this marveling or this um, being awestruck uh, calmed down. But I want to go back to page 71 because uh, we hear um, this reference, prisoner of love. And that's exactly what he is in every tabernacle in every church around the world, a prisoner of love. And so uh, for at the beginning of this uh, passage uh, where the, the headline, the bold print is, you might make a notation, Eucharistic adoration with a question mark, asking yourself, how much time do I spend in front of the Blessed Sacrament? Especially when the churches are still... Uh, open because there may be a day again sometime in the future when they are not may it please god that never happens and <clears throat> may we be about reparation for the long hours and days and weeks and months that he was in the tabernacle with the doors locked when even the pastors were uh, not unlocking them whether that was obedience to their bishops or uh, the uh, cdc or whatever <clears throat> So we have to keep in mind now that the possibility to spend time with our Lord in Eucharistic adoration should not be ignored because the very fact that he's left abandoned in those tabernacles for long hours in many churches may be the very reason that the world is in its present condition. Instead of a flood of people back into the churches and intensification of all their religious practices, infidelity, it seems like there's been a reduction, even though some have come back. <clears throat> and so reparation is necessary and reparation and Eucharistic adoration is really important. So I wrote on the margin of uh, page 71 for this entry, our work. This is part of what we are to be doing, not just in Eucharistic adoration, as important as that is, but in the course of the day. So if you go down one, two, three, four, five lines and you put a bracket or start a bracket where it says, and while keeping you company, I intend, okay, you can make that your prayer all the way down to where it, it picks up with silly, silly. So all of what she's saying prior to her being awestruck over who can count all the drops of water, okay, it, prior to that, with the divine will, She's placing I love you's on all these different uh, <clears throat> uh, portions of creation and actions. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. And uh, the more that we do that, the, uh, the more that souls might be saved, uh, the more reparation can be made for our own deficiencies of the past, but all souls as well. And that's what she's doing. She's making reparation to the Eucharistic Lord who's a prisoner there, and you can be sure that he's very pleased with that action, with that prayer, with that sacrifice. Okay, we move on. August 12th, 1904. Man disperses the beauty with which God created him. As I continued struggling, all of a sudden I found all of myself inside our Lord, and from his head a shining thread descended into mine, which bound me completely inside of Jesus. Oh, how happy I was to be inside of him. As much as I looked, I could see nothing but him alone. This is my highest happiness, only Jesus, him alone and nothing else. Oh, how well one feels. Meanwhile, he told me, courage, my daughter. Don't you see how the thread of my will binds you completely inside of me? So if any other will wants to bind you, if it is not holy, it cannot, because since you are inside of me, if it is not holy, it cannot enter into me. And while saying this, he looked at me over and over again, and then he added, I created the soul with a rare beauty. I endowed her with a light superior to any other created light. And yet man disperses this beauty inside ugliness and this light inside darkness. So 
So I wrote avoid sin at all costs with an exclamation point because our sinfulness, even venial sins, and even little white lies, because there's no such thing as a white lie. So there's nothing that's contrary to the will of God that is white or good. Okay, so it diminishes any sinful choices. Uh, it diminishes the brilliance of the light that he says he places in each and every one of us when he created each and every one of us that is more beautiful, brighter than any other created light. So think about the sun. The beauty that he puts in each soul is more beautiful, more brilliant before the heavenlies in an innocent, uh, newly born soul, especially after baptism, than the sun. But what reduces that brilliance is our own selfish choices, our own disobedience uh, as we go through life. Uh, the, the good news is that... Um, as we're learning about the divine will, the more that we invite the divine will into our souls and into everything that we do and all that we are, the more that the, the clouds that have formed from bad choices in the past, even forgiven sins, the, the, the uh, scars from past sins that have been forgiven. So let's say, for example, you commit a sin uh, and it, ca it causes a a, a scar on the soul well actually an open wound until it's forgiven until you repent and the best way is to uh, repent through the sacrament of reconciliation including for venial sins and then that you don't have an open wound anymore it's been sealed up and you get an infusion of grace in the absolution <clears throat> then grace-filled acts and especially the divine will being invited into your actions starts to eradicate the scars so that there's not a trace any longer of the sins that have been committed. And the Lord wants to do this work in us, but he, he needs us to want it because he won't go against our free will. Okay, go ahead. August 14th, 1904. The more the blows of the cross knock the soul down, the more light she acquires. As I was little in suffering, blessed Jesus on coming said to me, my beloved daughter, the more the iron is beaten, the more light it acquires. And even if the iron did not have rust, the blows serve to keep it shiny and free of dust. So whoever comes close to that iron can easily reflect himself in it as if it were a mirror. The same for the soul. The more the blows of the cross knock her down, the more light she acquires and she maintains herself dusted of any slightest thing in such a way that whoever comes close to her can reflect himself in her as if she were a mirror. And naturally, being a mirror, she performs its office to show whether faces are stained or clean, whether they are beautiful or ugly. Not only this, but I myself delight in going to reflect myself in her and finding in her no dust or any other thing that may prevent me from reflecting my image in her, I love her more and more. The more that we read the volumes, the more we will have revealed to us the true state of our soul. <clears throat> and if we run from those beatings of the cross, it's a choice to stay in the present state, which he refers to as ugly, or to allow him to bring about that, that mirror likeness. Uh, you know, uh, the, we're in the, the volumes that are teaching us, it's like the school of the virtues, so that we can become mirrors of the, of the true God. Okay, go ahead. August 15th, 1904. Melancholy is to the soul as winter to the plants. The triumph of the church is not far. This morning I felt all oppressed with a melancholy that filled my whole soul. It seemed that blessed Jesus did not let me struggle too much. And on seeing me so oppressed, he told me, my daughter, why this melancholy? Don't you know that melancholy is to the soul is winter to the plants as it strips them of the leaves and prevents them from producing flowers and fruits. So much so 
that if the gaiety of spring and of heat did not come, the poor plants would remain incapacitated and would end up withering. Such is melancholy for the soul. It strips her of divine freshness, which is like rain that makes the virtues turn all green again. It renders their incapable of doing good. And if she does good, she does it with difficulty and almost out of necessity, not out of virtue. It prevents her from growing in grace. And if she does not stir herself with a holy gaiety, which is spring rain that gives development to the plants in a very short time, she will end up withering in good. So how do you stir up holy gaiety? Uh, <clears throat> dwelling upon the goodness of God, uh, thinking about the so many ways that he's blessed you, thinking about the ways that he's protected you in times of danger, uh, uh, thinking uh, and acknowledging and thanking him for the so many gifts that have he's given you. It, <clears throat> it uh, could be uh, um, material gifts, but also spiritual gifts, uh, gifts of emotion in healthy relationships with family and friends, there's so many ways that you can focus on the way God has provided, divine providence has taken care of you with gratitude, and it will drive melancholy away. So melancholy for the soul, it strips her of divine freshness. So that light that he puts in us, it can diminish that light if we focus on ourselves and what we don't like about what's happening, or we get kind of gray. Yeah. It renders her incapable, incapable of doing good. That would be a pretty strong level. Uh, uh, you know, we can be depressed about certain things and have no energy, not feel like doing anything, just want to even stay in bed sometimes, okay? That's, uh, that's for people who allow it to linger instead of getting the focus off of their condition or their themselves and shifting them to the goodness of God and the love that he has for us. Okay, go ahead. Now, while he was saying this, in one flash, I saw the whole church, the wars which the religious must go through and which they must receive from others and wars among societies. There seemed to be a general uproar. War. It also seemed that the Holy Father would make use of every few, very few religious people, both for bringing the state of the church, the priests and others to good order and for the society in the state of turmoils. Now, while I was seeing this, blessed Jesus told me, do you think that the triumph of the church is far? And I, yes, indeed. Who can put order in so many things that are messed up? And he, on the contrary, I tell you that it is near. It takes a clash, but a strong one. And therefore I will permit everything together among religious and secular so as to shorten the time. And in the midst of this clash, all of being, all of big chaos, there will be a good and orderly clash, but in such a state of mortification that men will see themselves as lost. However, I will give them so much grace and light that they may recognize what is evil and embrace the truth, making you suffer also for this purpose. If with all this, they do not listen to me, then I will take you to heaven and things will happen even more gravely and will drag on a little longer before the longed for triumph. And so we need to ask the Lord to raise up additional victim souls. Uh, this will be our last uh, entry for tonight. Thank you, um, Melanie, for uh, your uh, willingness to help us with the readings. You're welcome. Uh, I, I would encourage you this... Uh, passage that starts on page 73 after the first paragraph that addresses his instruction to her to stir up gaiety and not to wallow in melancholy the this set the second paragraph starts at the bottom of 73 and continues uh to the end on 74 of this uh particular passage <clears throat> it's worth um dog-earing the page and reading it uh, maybe every time you see or hear that something troubling is going on in the church, uh, he makes it clear that it is the uh, 
uh, what, what's happening is good for us, these clashes. He doesn't will uh, uh, individuals to sin. Uh, he doesn't will individuals to promote confusion or chaos within the church or uh, uh, the precepts of the church. But he allows the clash to bring clarity in those who want to seek the truth or be reinforced in the truth. Uh, I am certain, though, that he doesn't want uh, good and faithful souls to be the, um, the ones that uh, push forward the clash. So we want to be careful that we don't shift into that judgmental, hypercritical, gossipy kind of, whether it's gossip that you type and send all over the web. Uh, we need to be uh, recognizing all of these problems that are going on today as the cause for more prayers with a genuine concern for souls. And uh, that little uh, chaplet uh, for uh, sanct purification and sanctification of priests is a good one. Divine Mercy Chaplet is very powerful. That's our work. And may it please God that we remember as soon as we see that there's something more that's troubling that's going on within the church or someone that's speaking related to the church, uh, or when someone is in a high office uh, secularly uh, and uh, saying um, uh, they're questioning when life begins, uh, not sure if life begins at conception and all the silliness that's going on out there, we need to be praying for those poor souls instead of uh, standing in judgment <clears throat> and, um, and inviting the divine will into all that we say and do. We're going to close with um, uh, the prayer for the deliverance of uh, all souls who are in any way caught up in darkness, dark practices, uh, thoughts that are uh, leaving the door open, so to speak, um, points in their souls to darkness. We invite the divine will to pray in our praying so that we may come before the most holy trinity as if every soul past, present, and future was asking for freedom and deliverance from the so many things that hold us back, hold the humanity back from the reign of the divine will on earth as it reigns in heaven. And so we pray, O Lord, you are all powerful. You are God. You are our Father. We beg you through the intercession and help of the archangels Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel for the deliverance of our brothers and sisters who are enslaved by the evil one. All saints of heaven come to our aid from anxiety, sadness, and obsessions. We beg you, free us, O Lord, from hatred, envy, fornication. We beg you, free us, O Lord, from thoughts of jealousy, rage, and death. We beg you, free us, O Lord, from every thought of suicide and abortion. We beg you, free us, O Lord, from every form of sinful sexuality. We beg you, free us, O Lord, from every division in our family and every harmful friendship. We beg you, free us, O Lord, from every sort of spell, malefice, witchcraft, and every form of the occult. We beg you, free us, O Lord. You said, Lord Jesus, I leave you peace. My peace I give you. Grant that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary, we may be liberated from every evil spell. Enjoy your peace always in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Come divine will, reign on us. Come to reign on earth. Amen. And uh, I hope to see many of you, as many are able to spend the time with us in the mountains for the day of prayer tomorrow. And those who are too far away or committed for other family activities or, or business, uh, please choose to be united with us in the divine will. Uh, that we may all be one in the will of God and uh, effective instruments of his to hasten the coming of the divine will on earth as in heaven. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us strive to live the will of God always. Amen. <clears throat>